My name is Lauren, and I was my mom's first child. She had me when she was still figuring out her life. She got married young, right after high school, to my dad, Scott. They were more focused on love than on money, which didn't work out well for long. I was still just a little kid when she met Kyle, a guy with a lot of money and a fancy car. She left my dad, took me with her and never looked back, except to collect the alimony checks. At first, Kyle seemed nice. He would bring me little treats and let me play in his big office filled with shiny things. But my mom changed around him. She always looked at me like I reminded her of a life she wanted to forget. One evening, I overheard them talking in the kitchen while I was supposed to be watching TV. She's too much like Scott, my mom said sharply. Always asking questions, always looking at me like he used to. I didn't understand what she meant at the time, but it hurt to hear her talk about me like I was a problem. I loved my real dad. Sure, he lived in a small apartment on the other side of the city, but every moment with him was fun, even if we were just playing in the park or eating cheap pizza. My mom's words from that night stuck with me, and she only became more critical over time. Can't you do anything right? She'd say whenever I tried to help around the house or did my schoolwork in the living room. My dad, on the other hand, was different. You're doing great, Lauren, he'd tell me whenever I showed him my grades or a drawing from school. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Life at my mom and Kyle's house got more stressful when I started school. My mom was always talking about appearances how I needed to wear the right clothes and hang out with the right kids. Why can't you dress like Karen's daughter? Look at her, she'd say, showing me a picture from a party I wasn't invited to. One day, after she scolded me for tracking mud into the hallway, I finally snapped back. At least Dad doesn't yell about a bit of dirt. The slap came fast, her hand stinging my cheek before I knew it. I even saw it move. Don't talk about your father like that, she hissed, her face close to mine her breath smelling of coffee and anger. Tears started to fill my eyes, but I held them back, just like Dad taught me. That night, lying in my bed, I promised myself I wouldn't let her see me cry. I wouldn't give her that satisfaction. When Mom announced she was pregnant again, the whole house felt different, like something big was about to change and not in a good way. She had that glow people talk about when they're expecting but it never seemed to shine in my direction. I'm having a baby with the man I love, Kyle. It's going to be perfect, Mom said one evening, rubbing her belly while Kyle beamed like he'd won a prize. Kyle, always trying to charm, added, we'll need to redo the guest room, make it fit for a little princess. My heart sank. They were talking about my room, my little corner in their world. What about my room? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Mom shot me a look, her smile turning tight. You can move into the smaller room, Lauren. It's only fair. The baby will need the space. The way she said fair made it sound like it was already decided, no room for arguing. So I moved, packed up my things, and settled into the smallest room in the house, barely bigger than a closet. Time flew by, and soon Mary was born. She was all anyone could talk about. Isn't she just the most beautiful baby you've ever seen? Mom would gush to her friends over the phone, cradling Mary like she was the most precious thing in the world. Yeah, she's cute, I'd mutter, trying to join the conversation. Cute was an understatement Mary was adorable, and I couldn't help but love her from the moment I saw her. I wanted to be a good big sister, to be involved and help out. One afternoon, I tried to sneak into Mary's room while Mom was busy in the kitchen. I tiptoed in, peering over the crib at my baby sister, who was gurgling happily. Hey there, Mary, I whispered, reaching out a finger for her to grab. But Mom must have heard me, because suddenly she was at the door, her voice sharp as a knife. What are you doing, Lauren? I told you to ask before going into her room. I just wanted to see her, I protested feeling the familiar sting of tears pricking my eyes. I wanted to help, but Dad was different. During one of my weekends with him, I'd opened up while we were having pizza at our favorite spot. 
Mom's always on edge when I'm around Mary. It's like she thinks I'll break her or something, I said. Dad chewed thoughtfully before replying, You know, Lauren, some people just have a hard time sharing love. It's like they think there's only so much to go around. But remember, you've got a big heart. Don't let your mom's behavior make you think otherwise. His words helped a little, but back at mom's house, the distance between us kept growing. Even when I tried to share stories about school or friends, mom's attention was always split, half listening and half watching Mary. One day, I came home with a school award second place in the science fair. I was so excited, clutching the certificate like it was a ticket to their approval. Look, mom, I won this. I exclaimed, holding it out to her as she fed Mary. That's nice, dear, she said without looking up. Put it on the fridge or something. Or something, I echoed to myself, the words feeling empty. I stuck the certificate on the fridge, a bit crooked, and stepped back. To them, it was just another piece of paper, just another day in Mary's shadow. By the time I reached high school, things were pretty rough at home. Between mom's cold shoulders and Kyle's indifference, I felt more like a guest than a part of the family. It was around then that the bomb-dropped mom decided it was time for me to live with dad permanently. The day she told me we were having dinner. It was one of those rare moments where it was just her and me at the table. Kyle was late from work, and Mary was already tucked in. Lauren, we need to talk about your future, mom started, pushing her food around her plate with a fork. There was no warmth in her voice, just a cold, business-like tone that immediately made me nervous. What about it? I asked, trying to sound casual, but my heart was racing. We've been discussing things, and we think it's best if you move in with your father. With the new baby coming, things here are well, they're complicated. I almost choked on my water. Move in with dad. But why? I thought everything was fine here. Mom sighed, a sound full of impatience. Look, Lauren, you're not a child anymore. You need your own space, and we can't provide that here, not with the new situation. It's cramped, and frankly, the financial burden is more than we expected. It's better for everyone this way. I pushed my plate away, no longer hungry. And what about school, my friends? You can go to a new school, make new friends, she said, as if it were that simple, as if my life could be easily replaced. It felt like I had to erase my life and start over without any trouble. The next few weeks were a blur as I packed up my things, my whole world shrinking into boxes, books, clothes, and the few keepsakes that meant something to me. Kyle barely said goodbye and Mary, too young to understand, gave me a confused hug. Moving day was tough. Dad lived on the other side of town in a small apartment. It was clean but cluttered with memories of a life paused since mom left him. He was standing there waiting for me with open arms and a worried smile when I arrived. The apartment was nothing like the house I grew up in. My new room was half the size of my old one, with walls that needed paint and a window that looked out at a brick wall. But it was quiet, and dad was trying his best to make it feel like home. The first day of the new school was rough. As I walked down the crowded hallways, I could feel the stares and hear the whispers. That's the new girl, they'd say, as if I were some kind of oddity. In class, I kept to myself, doodling in my notebook and trying to block out the murmurs. When the bell rang, I was the first one out the door, not wanting to linger. At home, Dad noticed my mood. How was school? He asked, trying to keep his tone light. It was fine, I lied shrugging off my coat and dropping my bag by the door. If it gets tough, you tell me, okay? We're in this together. You're not alone, Lauren. His words meant a lot, but the loneliness I felt was deep and gnawing. It wasn't just about missing my old friends or the big house. It was about feeling unwanted, like I was pushed out because I was too much of a burden. Adjusting to life at Dad's wasn't easy but I quickly realized that if I didn't pull myself together, things would only get worse. One morning, I woke up, looked around my cramped room, and decided it was time to take charge of my life. No one else is going to do it for me, I muttered under my breath. 
Dad noticed the change in me almost immediately. Over breakfast one day, he looked up from his coffee and said, You're looking more determined these days, Lauren. What's on your mind? I stirred my cereal, thinking about how to put it into words. I want to make something of myself, Dad. I don't want to end up stuck, you know. He nodded, a serious look crossing his face. I hear you, kiddo. So what's the plan? That scholarship, the big one for the top students I'm going to get it. I declared, more to convince myself than him. Dad's smile was all the encouragement I needed. I needed that scholarship, and if anyone could get it, it was me. Dad said, just tell me what you need from me. School was tough, with long hours spent catching up and even longer evenings buried in books. My teachers noticed the change. Even the tough ones seemed to respect how hard I was working. Mr. Jeremy, my math teacher, kept me after class one day. Lauren, your work has improved a lot. What's driving this? He asked. I need that scholarship. I replied bluntly, packing up my stuff. I've got plans, and they don't include being stuck here forever. Mr. Jeremy studied me for a moment, then nodded slowly. Well, keep at it, and let me know if you need extra help. I'm here. Making friends wasn't easy, but I managed to find a few people who didn't mind that I was focused on my goals. During lunch, I'd sit with Linda and Peter, two kids who weren't exactly popular but knew how to laugh. So, Lauren, you're like a library ninja now, huh? Peter joked one day, nudging me as we sat down with our trays. I cracked a smile. Yeah, got to be stealthy if I want to snag the best study spots. Linda chimed in, her voice soft but sincere. It's cool what you're doing, Lauren. Most wouldn't bother. Days turned into months, and the pressure grew as the application deadlines got closer. Dad was my rock always there with a hot meal and a listening ear whenever the stress became too much. The day I got the scholarship letter, my hands were shaking as I tore it open. Dad was right there, holding his breath. I scanned the words, my heart pounding, and then I cheered so loud the neighbors probably heard. I got it, Dad. I got it. I jumped up, the letter flapping in my hand like a flag of victory. Dad swept me up in a big hug, laughing and cheering right along with me. I knew it. I knew you could do it. As I packed up my things for college a few months later, I felt ready. The future was bright, and for the first time, it felt like it was truly mine. I was leaving, but I was taking all these lessons, all this love and hard-earned wisdom with me. After graduating with honors and establishing a solid career, I finally felt like I was on stable ground. I was 25, doing well at my job, and had just started dating a great guy from work named Eric, who had been nothing but supportive. Then, out of the blue, my mom called. We hadn't spoken much since I moved out, but suddenly here she was, asking no, more like telling me something. Lauren, your sister Mary is going to college in your city. We've paid her tuition, and we think it'd be best if she stayed with you. Mom said, making it clear this wasn't just a suggestion. I hesitated, memories of our strained relationship running through my mind, but I wanted to believe things could be different this time. Okay, Mom, I'll help Mary out. It might be nice to reconnect, I said, trying to keep any doubts out of my voice. Mary moved in two weeks later, and it was obvious right away that we were very different. She was as stunning as ever, completely focused on her looks and living a high-maintenance lifestyle. She brought with her a suitcase full of expectations and a personality that expected them to be met. Can you make sure we have almond milk and kale? I'm on a special diet, Mary said casually on her first evening, checking herself out in the mirror. Sure, I'll add them to the grocery list, I replied, trying to be accommodating but living with Mary turned out to be harder than I expected. She partied like there was no tomorrow, often coming home at dawn, her carefree laughter echoing through the apartment while I lay awake, worrying about work meetings and presentations. One afternoon, Eric came over while Mary was getting ready for another night out. I noticed how she smiled at him just a bit too sweetly and for a bit too long. After she left, Eric spoke up. 
Lauren, I think Mary's got the wrong idea about me. She's been, well, flirty. I felt a wave of anger and embarrassment. Thanks for telling me, Eric, I'll talk to her. When I confronted Mary, she just laughed it off. Oh, come on, Lauren, I'm just being friendly. Besides, can I help it if he likes me back? That's my fiancé, Mary. You need to respect that, I replied, my voice firm. Her laugh turned cold. Lauren, I'm used to getting what I want. I always have. That was the last straw. I couldn't live like this, feeling like I had to guard my life for my own sister. You need to find another place to live, Mary. This isn't working out, I said, making it clear that I meant it. I told her my decision was final, and Mary stormed out, slamming the door behind her. Within an hour, my phone rang. It was Mom, and her voice was cold and sharp. You're such a jealous girl, Lauren. You can't stand to see your sister happy, can you? I just want respect, Mom, that's all, I replied, but it was like talking to a wall. After that, things went quiet between Mary and me. I heard through the grapevine that she dropped out of college and was drifting through her social circles on charm and whims. As for me, I refocused on my life with Eric, my work, and rebuilding my boundaries. Three years flew by since I last tried to patch things up with my family. Things were going well for me, I was moving up at work, and life with Eric was better than ever. That's when I heard the news about Mary. She had dropped out of college and was getting married to some rich guy she'd met. Feeling a mix of curiosity and goodwill, I picked up the phone to call home and offer my congratulations. Mom answered, her voice cold and distant as always. Mom, I heard about Mary's wedding. I just wanted to say congratulations. I started, trying to keep my tone light. Well, don't bother. We're not waiting for you at the wedding. It's for rich people only, and we don't need any beggars there, she spat out, her words cutting deep. I clenched the phone a little tighter, feeling the old sting of rejection. Really, Mom, that's how you're going to be. What did you expect, Lauren? You've always been the difficult one. Just stay away, she said before hanging up. I stood there, foam in hand, the dial tone echoing in my ear. The hurt was real, but I wasn't going to let it ruin me. I found out later that they'd spared no expense on Mary's wedding, hiring popular artists and actors to make it a lavish affair. Time passed, and life didn't stand still for me either. Eric proposed, and suddenly I was planning my own wedding nothing extravagant, but every bit filled with love and sincerity. I called Dad to share the news. He was overjoyed. Lauren, that's wonderful. You bet I'll be there. I wouldn't miss it for the world, he said, his voice brimming with happiness. Encouraged by Dad's reaction, I made one last attempt to bridge the gap with my mom. I dialed her number, my heart racing as I waited for her to pick up. Mom, I'm getting married. I want you to come, I said, holding my breath. Her reply was as cold as a winter breeze. No, Lauren, not interested in attending some modest gathering of losers. Count me out. I swallowed hard, fighting back the hurt. All right, Mom, take care, I said and hung up, knowing it was probably the last time I'd invite her into my life. Our wedding day was simple but beautiful. Dad walked me down the aisle, his presence a steady comfort. The room was filled with genuine smiles and heartfelt congratulations, a stark contrast to the grandeur and coldness of Mary's wedding spectacle. Our modest reception was filled with laughter, dancing, and stories. Eric and I mingled with friends and family who loved us for who we were, not for money or status. Life was going well, and Eric and I were thrilled to be expecting our first child. Then one ordinary afternoon, my phone rang and the voice on the other end turned my day upside down. It was mom, and she wasn't calling to congratulate me. Lauren, you have to take us in. We're desperate, she blurted out without even a hello. Mom, what's going on? I asked, though part of me didn't want to know. It's all gone wrong. Kyle's business failed, we mortgaged the house for Mary's wedding, and now it's all just gone, and your sister's marriage is over. Her husband kicked her out and is demanding money for her cheating, she explained hurriedly, 
her voice edged with panic. I took a deep breath, trying to process the flood of information. Okay, slow down. What exactly are you asking of me? We need a place to stay all of us. We're coming to your house, she stated matter-of-factly, as if it were the most obvious solution. The request, or rather, the demand hit me hard. No, mom, you can't just decide to move in with us. It doesn't work like that. Lauren, you owe us after everything we've done for you, she snapped, her voice sharp and commanding. That struck a nerve. Oh, you, mom? Remember how you were when I needed you most? You pushed me out. You chose everything over me. And now you expect me to just open my doors. Her voice rose. You're being selfish, Lauren. Where is your family spirit? I am your mother. And you've never let me forget it. But being a mother doesn't mean what you think it does. It's not about debts and demands. I shot back, my patience wearing thin. Her fury was palpable even through the phone. You'll regret this, Lauren. I might even take you to court to get what I deserve. I couldn't help but laugh, but it was more from disbelief than anything else. Go ahead and try, Mom. Remember, Dad was my guardian when you kicked me out. What are you going to claim? That your daughter wouldn't let you live off her after you threw her out. There was a pause, and I could almost hear her thinking. This isn't over, Lauren, she finally hissed before hanging up. Life after that last call with mom felt like a fresh start, a real new beginning. Eric and I were busy getting the nursery ready picking out paint colors, assembling the crib, and navigating the usual ups and downs of pregnancy. It was a bright and early Friday morning, and I was setting up some baby clothes we had just bought, folding them neatly into the new dresser. Eric was drilling something in the corner, the electric screwdriver buzzing away. He stopped, wiped his forehead, and looked over at me with a smile. How's it going over there, Lauren? Need any help? I've got it, thanks. Just thinking about everything. It's really happening, huh? I responded, running my hand over a tiny soft onesie. It really is. We're going to be parents, Lauren, he said, his voice full of awe and a bit of nervous excitement. Just then, there was a knock at the door. I was surprised who could it be this early on a Friday. Eric went to answer it while I continued organizing. I heard voices, and then Eric called out, Lauren, it's for you. Walking into the living room, I was surprised to see my dad standing there with a big grin on his face and a teddy bear in hand. Surprise, he exclaimed. Dad, what are you doing here? I couldn't hide my delight as I rushed over to give him a big hug. I wanted to come and see how my favorite daughter is doing, and I brought something for my future grandchild. He handed me the teddy bear, which was soft and cuddly. Thank you, Dad. It means the world to me that you're here, I said, feeling a bit emotional. We sat down, and Dad looked around at the half-assembled baby furniture and the stacks of baby books. Looks like you're almost ready for the little one. We're trying. It's a lot, but we're excited, I told him, then paused, biting my lip. Dad, I had another call with Mom. It didn't go well. Dad's expression turned serious. I heard about it from your mom. She wasn't too pleased, was she? No, she wasn't. But Dad, I stood my ground. I had to for me, for Eric, and for the baby. We need peace here. I said firmly. The day passed with us sharing stories, Dad giving us some unsolicited but funny parenting advice, and just enjoying being together. It was a good day, one of those days you know you'll look back on fondly. As the sun set, painting the sky in shades of orange and pink, Eric, Dad, and I sat on the porch, a gentle breeze rustling the leaves. Eric put his arm around me, and I leaned into him. Despite everything with mom and all the drama, I feel lucky. We have each other, and we're about to start this amazing new chapter. I have a feeling it's going to be great, I said, looking out at the fading light. Eric kissed the top of my head. It will be. We've got this, Lauren. As night fell and dad said his goodbyes, I felt a deep sense of contentment and readiness for what was to come. The challenges with my mom and the uncertainty of new beginnings had been tough, but they led me here, 
to this moment, surrounded by love and support. My name is Michelle. Growing up, the difference between my twin sister Linda and me was like night and day. She was the golden girl, and I was not. Our dad, a strict university professor, was always buried in books and lectures, while our mom was the perfect housewife, focused on home and family, urging us to follow her example. From as early as I can remember, being at home felt like sitting through a never-ending critique session. My parents had a plan for the perfect family, and it did not include a daughter who wore band t-shirts and liked to keep to herself. Michelle, why can't you be more like your sister? Was my mom's favorite line, usually directed at me when I showed up at breakfast with my headphones on, trying to shut out the world. Linda, on the other hand, basked in the glow of approval. I just don't get why it's so hard for you to put on a nice dress and smile more, she'd say, flipping her perfect hair over her shoulder. It felt like she was from a different planet. One particularly tough Saturday, as our family got ready for one of Dad's faculty parties, a total bore, but a mandatory event for us, I decided to rebel in the smallest way I knew how. I put on my darkest eyeliner and a pair of boots that definitely did not meet the acceptable standard. You're not going out like that, are you? Mom caught me on the stairs, her eyes glaring at my boots as if they were dirty. I shrugged my usual defense. Don't see why not. She sighed, that long, drawn-out kind that said I was the biggest disappointment in her perfectly organized world. Please, Michelle, just this once, can't you try to fit in? What for? So you can pretend we're the perfect family? I shot back, tired of the same old argument. It's not about pretending. It's about showing respect for your father, she argued, her voice taking on that sharp tone that meant business. Linda, overhearing the exchange came trotting down the hallway, her heels clicking on the hardwood floor like a judge approaching the bench. Mom's right, Amy, it's not that hard to look decent. Why do you always have to make things difficult? I don't want to be a clone of you, Linda, I snapped, feeling my face get hot. I hated these arguments, hated being compared, but more than anything, I hated feeling like the odd one out in my own home. Dad appeared at the bottom of the stairs, his brow furrowed. Michelle, go change now. We're leaving in 15 minutes, he said firmly. His tone left no room for argument. He didn't yell, he didn't need to. The disappointment in his eyes was enough to send me marching back to my room to swap my boots for plain flats and wipe away half my eyeliner. As we drove to the party, the car was silent except for the classical music Dad insisted on playing because it was calming. I stared out the window, watching the trees blur past. In that moment, I promised myself that someday I'd live a life where no one could tell me what to wear, how to act, or who to be. Someday, I'd be free from these expectations. My room was the only corner of the house where I could pretend I was somewhere else, anywhere else. Unlike the rest of the house, which was filled with my parents' choices, my room was mine. It wasn't much, just three walls covered in sketches and music posters, but it was my escape from the reality of my family's expectations. One evening, as I was trying to lose myself in a playlist of my favorite bands, Dad knocked and marched into my room, his face set in a familiar frown. Michelle, turn that noise down. And why haven't you studied with Linda today? You know you both have exams coming up, he said, his voice stern. I pulled out one earbud and looked up at him, trying to keep my voice calm. I've been studying, just not with Linda. I learn better on my own. Dad shook his head, clearly not believing me. You know the rules. Your sister gets good grades, and you should be doing the same. I don't see why you always have to make things difficult. It's not about making things difficult, I said, feeling my frustration grow. I just don't see why I have to do everything Linda's way. Can't I have my own way of studying? He didn't respond to that, just switched to another complaint. And those friends of yours, I saw you with them at the cafe yesterday. I don't think they're a good influence. You should be spending time with the daughters of my colleagues. They're more suitable. I felt my temper rising. Suitable for what? For you? 
because they talk about economics and pretend to enjoy those boring university gatherings. Before he could answer, Mom appeared at the doorway, her voice sharp. Michelle, your father is right. Those girls are from good families. They know how to behave. They're the kind of friends you should want. I stood up, facing both of them. What if I don't want friends who are picked for me? What if I want to choose my own friends, choose what I study, or even decide what I want to be? That's enough, Michelle, Mom said firmly. You know your future is with the university. Your father has made sure of that. And after you graduate, you'll need to start thinking about settling down. We've already discussed this. Settling down. The words felt like a prison sentence. You mean thinking about being someone's wife, like Linda? Is that all you think I've meant for? Mom's face softened a bit, but her voice stayed firm. We want what's best for you. Following the path we've set out will give you a good life. A good life, I repeated, the irony bitter in my mouth. Is it a good life if it's someone else's idea of good? No one answered. They didn't need to. We all knew there was no point in arguing. They had their plans, and they expected me to follow them, just like Linda. Linda and I were like two sides of the same coin, always together but never on the same page. At the university where Dad taught, the differences between us became even clearer. She was into business management, the golden child always nodding along in lectures and asking smart questions that made the professors smile. Me, I was stuck in the same program, but it felt like wearing the shoe on the wrong foot awkward, uncomfortable, and just plain wrong. One afternoon, as I was struggling through a pile of textbooks in the library, Linda breezed in, her notes organized, her smile ready. Hey, Amy, you coming to the study group tonight? Professor Hall mentioned he might drop by. It could be good for us to show up, she said, her tone light but insistent. I glanced up, feeling the weight of her expectations. No, I don't think so. Those things aren't really my scene, you know. She frowned, putting her books down with a thud that matched her disapproval. It's not about it being your scene, Amy. It's about making the right impressions. You need to start taking this seriously. We're graduating soon. I shrugged and turned back to my notes. I am taking it seriously, just not in a way that makes me unhappy. Why should I pretend? Because, Amy, sometimes you have to play the game to get ahead, she said, waving at her neat textbooks and color-coded notes. It's not about liking it. It's about doing what's necessary. I shook my head and pushed my chair back with a scrape. Well, maybe I'm tired of doing what's necessary according to everyone else. Did you ever think of that? Her voice softened, but her eyes were still firm. Amy, I'm just trying to help you. Dad won't always be around to fix things. What will you do if you keep pushing everyone away? Maybe I'll figure it out on my own. Maybe I don't need to follow Dad's path or yours, I replied, feeling a surge of defiance. Linda sighed, clearly frustrated. You're so stubborn. Just try, okay. For me, if not for yourself, show up tonight and talk to Professor Hall. It won't kill you. I looked at her, really looked, and saw not just my perfect sister, but someone who cared in her own way. Fine, I'll think about it. I conceive it, not ready to promise more. Thank you, she said, her smile returning. It's not that bad, you know. You might even like it if you gave it a chance. Doubt it, I muttered, but I knew I had lost this round. For Linda, I'd show up, sit through another boring discussion, and not at the right times. It was just a few hours. How bad could it be? As it turned out, not as bad as I thought. Professor Hall was surprisingly interesting when he wasn't lecturing from a podium. I even asked a question, which earned a shocked but pleased look from Linda. Later, as we walked back to our dorm, Linda nudged me. See, not so terrible, right? That fragile piece didn't last long. In our final year, Linda introduced us to her fiancé, a lawyer 12 years older, already well-established and exactly what our parents dreamed of. Mom and Dad were thrilled, praising Linda for making such a smart choice. Then they turned their hopeful eyes on me. 
Now, Michelle, it's your turn to find someone suitable, Dad said one evening over dinner, his tone implying my time was running out. Mom nodded enthusiastically, already planning out my life as if it were another one of her well-organized projects. Think about your future, dear, someone who can provide for you, who has a good standing. I remember staring at my plate, feeling trapped. Linda's wedding was planned down to the smallest detail by mom. From the bridesmaids' dresses to the flowers, everything showed off her perfect vision of family prestige. After the wedding, mom often visited Linda, giving advice and making sure Linda's life went exactly as she had planned. Watching this, I knew one thing for sure. I didn't want my life controlled by someone else. One day, I was walking down the street, lost in thoughts about escaping the life my parents wanted for me, when I heard the deep rumble of a motorcycle. Curiosity made me look. That's when I saw him Brian, with his leather jacket and carefree smile, pulling up beside me. You look like you need a ride, he called over the roar of the engine, a playful sparkle in his eyes. I hesitated, looking back toward the path home, then at his outstretched hand. What did I have to lose? Sure, why not? I said, my voice a mix of nerves and excitement. Climbing onto the back of his bike, I felt a rush of adrenaline as we sped away. The wind whipped through my hair, and for the first time in a long while, I laughed a real laugh. Brian shouted something about showing me his world, and I held on tighter, not wanting the moment to end. We stopped at a diner popular with bikers, over burgers and fries. Brian told me about his life as a welder, his love for bikes, and his passion for the open road. It was so different from anything I was used to raw and real. Don't you get scared living like this? I asked, my voice barely rising above the clatter of plates and chatter around us. Scared? No, it's thrilling. You never know what's around the corner. Isn't that better than having everything planned out for you? He replied, his eyes lighting up with each word. Over the next few weeks, we met in secret. Each ride on Brian's motorcycle took me further from the life I was supposed to live and closer to the life I wanted. The speed, the adventure, it wasn't just about the thrill. It was about feeling alive, feeling free. One evening, as we watched the sunset from a secluded overlook, Brian turned to me. Michelle, I don't just ride to escape. I ride to feel alive, to make every moment count. With you, every moment feels like it's worth something. I leaned into him, my heart beating fast. I've never felt like this before. You make me feel free, Brian. He smiled, pulling me closer. Then let's not go back to just existing. Let's live. Five months with Brian felt like a lifetime of moments. I had always dreamed of the day he would propose under the stars, with the gentle rumble of his bike in the background. My heart said yes before my mouth could form the word. It was perfect, except for one big problem, my parents. I was scared to introduce Brian to them. He was everything they disapproved of his rough edges, his wild spirit, his simple but happy life as a welder. But love gave me courage, and I decided it was time for them to know. The day I brought Brian home, he wore his usual leather vest, red t-shirt, ripped jeans, and a bandana. I loved that about him he was always himself. As we walked up the driveway, I could already feel the weight of my parents' judgment. When we stepped inside, Mom's face went pale at the sight of Brian, her eyes widening in shock. What in the world, Michelle? She gasped, her voice barely a whisper. Dad's reaction was harsher, his words sharp as knives. Who is this? and why is he dressed like a thug in our house? I took a deep breath to steady my nerves. Mom, Dad, this is Brian. He's the man I love. We're getting married. The silence was deafening. Then Dad turned to Brian, his tone full of disdain. Married? What do you do for a living, young man? What are your qualifications? Brian, bless him, didn't waver. I'm a welder. I took some specialized courses after high school. I work hard and make an honest living. The look on my parents' faces was a mix of horror and disbelief. Mom looked like she might faint. A hey, welder, Michelle, you can't be serious. 
Dad's voice rose, anger flaring. You expect us to bless this, to throw away your future for a welder. I felt my resolve harden. Yes, because he makes me happy. Isn't that what should matter? But the life you'll lead, Mom started, her voice trembling. It will be the life I choose. I shot back, my own voice gaining strength. Dad shook his head, his decision clear. We cannot and will not support this. If you choose him, don't expect to be a part of this family. The finality in his tone broke my heart, but not my decision. Brian squeezed my hand, giving me the strength to face them. Then I choose Brian. I choose us. I choose my happiness. Mom's eyes filled with tears, and Dad's jaw clenched tight. If you walk out with him, don't bother coming back, Dad said, his voice cold. Walking away from my parents' house with Brian, my heart was a mess of emotions pain, relief, excitement, and fear all mixed into one. The night air felt different like each breath was a new beginning. I took a step further into a new life. We rode in silence for a while, the steady roar of the motorcycle beneath us. When we finally stopped at a small diner on the edge of town, Brian turned to me with a serious look. Are you sure about this, Michelle? I mean, really sure. There's no going back after tonight, he said, his eyes searching mine for any sign of doubt. I nodded, squeezing his hand tightly. I've never been more sure of anything. Being with you feels right. It feels like what I'm meant to do. He smiled that reckless, charming smile that had won me over the first day we met. All right then, let's do it. Let's start our life together. Inside the diner, we found a quiet booth in the corner. The waitress brought us two coffees without asking, and we sat there planning our next steps. So what's first? I asked stirring cream into my coffee and watching it swirl. We'll need to find a place to stay, at least for a while, and maybe look for jobs. I have some buddies who can help us get started, Brian replied, sounding practical but hopeful. It's going to be tough, isn't it? I said, more as a statement than a question. The reality of what we were doing was starting to sink in. Brian reached across the table and covered my hand with his. It might be, but we'll handle it together. Tough is nothing new for either of us, right? I couldn't help but laugh a short, genuine burst of amusement. Right, together. We spent hours in that diner talking and planning. Every so often, Brian would mention an idea that sounded so wild and free that it made my heart jump. And maybe one day, we'll save enough to take that road trip across the country. Just you, me, and the open road. I like that, I said, allowing myself to dream bigger than I ever had. Riding back into the city, we began our search. The next few weeks were a blur of activity. We found a small apartment on the edge of town. It wasn't fancy, but it was ours. Brian found work at a local garage, and I picked up shifts at a nearby diner. Life was hard, but it was ours. We made do with what we had and every night when we came home to each other, it felt like we had everything. Months later, we decided it was time to make it official and got married in a small, intimate ceremony. I held on to a small hope that my family would show up, that they would see how happy I was and let go of their prejudices. But the chairs we had reserved for them stayed empty, and no congratulatory messages came. Despite the sting of their absence, the day was perfect because it was ours. Over time, I grew very close to Brian's mom. She welcomed me with open arms, calling me her daughter and filling in the gaps left by my own family. Her warmth and acceptance helped heal some of the wounds left by my parents' rejection. Things finally started looking up for Brian and me. After he completed some additional training and became a certified underwater welder, his income shot up to $230,000 a year. That change made a huge difference. We managed to buy a townhouse in a nice area, the kind of place I had always dreamed about but never thought I'd actually live in. I started working as a dispatcher in Brian's company. It wasn't just a job. It felt like I was part of something important, supporting the man I loved and building our future together. 
On weekends, we escaped the city on his bike, roaring through winding roads and taking in the breathtaking views of nature. Those moments, with the wind in my hair and Brian's warmth against my back, were pure bliss. Living nearby, my mother-in-law became a frequent visitor. One afternoon, while Brian was tinkering in the garage and I was making coffee, she arrived looking a bit troubled. There's been some bad news, she said as she settled down at the kitchen table. Something about a professor at the university involved in a harassment scandal. My heart skipped a beat. Did they say who it was? I tried to keep my voice steady, dreading the answer. She shook her head. No, they didn't mention a name on the radio, but you know how these things go. It's probably all over the TV by now. Nodding, I turned on the television and tuned into the news. Sure enough, there was a report on the scandal. As I had feared, my father's face appeared on the screen. The anchor detailed the accusations against him, and I felt a cold wave of disbelief wash over me. Turning off the TV, I sat down heavily, trying to process the news. Brian came in, wiping his hands on a rag, and saw my face. What's wrong, babe? He asked, his brow furrowed in concern. I swallowed hard, my voice barely a whisper. It's my dad. He's been accused of harassing a student. Brian's expression grew serious for a moment before he came over and took my hand. I'm sorry, Michelle, that's tough news. How do you want to handle this? I shook my head, feeling unsure about everything. I don't know. I mean, what can I even do? We're not close anymore. He squeezed my hand, showing he understood. Whatever you need, I'm here for you. We don't have to figure it all out right now. I decided to wait and see how things unfolded before making any moves. Whatever decision I made, I knew Brian would be by my side, and that gave me the strength to face whatever came next. Life had been peaceful until that unexpected afternoon at work when a familiar car pulled into the parking lot. I hadn't seen my parents in a long time, and the sight of them stirred up a mix of emotions I thought I had put to rest. They both looked dramatically different. The scandal had taken its toll mom had lost a lot of weight and looked much older, while dad seemed broken, a shadow of the stern man he once was. My mother saw me and rushed over, arms open as if nothing had happened, as if years of distance and disapproval could be erased in an instant. But I couldn't embrace her, not now. Instead, I stepped back and took Brian's hand, drawing strength from his presence. Michelle, it was so hard to find you, Mom said, her voice cracking with emotion. Dad, always the blunt one, got straight to the point. His voice was harsh and bitter. I was accused unfairly, you know. I went to your sister's husband for help, but that leech wanted a fortune. Your sister sided with him, and now they've kicked us out. We need your help. I stared at them, disbelief and anger swirling inside me. Help? After all these years, you show up and demand help. We have nowhere else to go, Mom said desperately. They've disowned us too. We thought maybe we could stay with you. I almost laughed at the absurdity. Stay with me? After you disowned me, you made it clear I wasn't your daughter anymore. Dad's face turned red, his old temper flaring up. You owe us, Michelle, after all we've done for you. That's where you're wrong, I replied, feeling a newfound resolve. I cut them off, feeling Brian squeeze my hand for support. I don't owe you anything. You threw me out because I chose my happiness over your demands. And now you want to just move in and act like we're a family again? The situation was spiraling out of control, and I could see people watching, a small crowd beginning to form. Mom started to cry, her sobs loud and drawing even more attention. You're being ungrateful after everything we've done for you, she accused through her tears. I took a deep breath, my decision clear. No, Mom, I'm not ungrateful. I'm free and happy. You made your choices, and now you have to live with them. As we walked away, I heard my dad yelling, but Brian leaned over and quietly told the security team, don't let them come here again. The following months flew by, filled with love and peace. We welcomed a son, 
a new beginning for our growing family. My parents never came back. That day in the parking lot was the last time I saw them. While part of me grieved for what could have been, I knew I had made the right choice for myself and for my family.